Welcome to Massive Beers. My name is Matt. And we typically, the next words out of my mouth are, we do the beer stuff here. Almost always that follow, it precedes a beer review. And then we do a beer review and there's not much more beer stuff other than that. Even though we do podcasting stuff, all that fun stuff. Today we're doing something we haven't done before. Not a beer review. We've done a bunch of those. We're doing a, a, a movie review of all things. Yeah, never done one of those before. Um, but... Um, there is a beer movie um, out and about in some form or fashion that I watched today called Bottle Conditioned. Um, it's been a couple of years since it's been kind of on my radar. Um, I heard about it, I think, in 2019. Uh, someone was basically doing a, a documentary uh, about Lambic. And, um, you know, it's been kind of bipping and bobbing around for a couple of years. And it's finally been in the can. Um, and it's been making rounds for screenings um, on various different places. I'll put down below um, the link to where you can actually check out some of the screenings. Not all of them have been done. They've been running since March. Um, but today I went to Bethlehem to the Southside uh, Film Festival. Um, and a woman by the name of Jen Cotto, she actually helps run it. She's really big into beer, so that's my assumption is that she went out of her way to actually get this film as part of the film festival. And, um, you know, looking at a lot of the... Um, a lot of the uh, the screenings for this, it was very much, you know, Los Angeles and, and um, you know, New York, uh, London, you know what I mean? Like, a lot of international places. And it was like, you know, I'm going to kick myself in my own ass if I don't actually go and, and watch this screening. Um, just because it's, one, a film that interests me, a documentary that interests me, and two, it's, you know, Bethlehem's only about 45 minutes away. So, I, you know, being the day before uh, Dad's Day, Father's Day, I was like, God, that's kind of what I want to do for Dad's Day. I want to take a trip to Bethlehem and check out this film and so i did i went down there um I, I stopped at my favorite watering hole bond place brewing for about 45 minutes before the film uh started it was literally a block away from bond so I walked over um and caught the documentary you know i was kind of i was very impressed let's put it that way and again i'm not a film critic i'm not a a a, a film reviewer I'm barely a beer <laughs> reviewer but uh I found myself like super interested by it in a couple different ways because <sighs> Lambic's got a weird story for me, um, uh, or storied history for me, is that I've always drank it, I've never been ultra wild for Lambic. I, l I really enjoy it if it's if I'm in the mood and it's hit me the right way, it's some of the best beer I can drink in the moment, but I wouldn't even come close to calling myself a Lambic nerd, but I live in the beer world so I orbit a lot of people that do. And for me, seeing a film about Lambic, one of the biggest trepidations I had about the film was that it was just being going to be a bunch of pretentious pomp. Because honestly, that is a lot of what surrounds just the Lambic world. Um, so I went into it going, is it going to be a, a you know, documentary about um, you know, how Lambic is just the best thing in the history of mankind and and how about like it, it's it, it's it's basically the king of all beer and that people should know better than to not drink that uh, and it was not even close to that it's actually pretty um more um educational i mean documentaries typically are like that but a lot of them tend to be sensational this one is very much educational um a lot of the stuff in it i knew um and a lot of stuff i didn't which is always fun when you go into these and you learn a little bit of something new. Um, so the cusp of it is, or the the whole kit and caboodle of it is, it's basically a documentary that covers the um, you know the history of Lambic to a certain extent. It doesn't go super far back, even though it touches into the histories of several of, of the breweries and blenderies that are in there. Um, but it kind of you know goes from how Lambic was gonna pretty much die um to where now it's come back and it's it, it's kind of in its best position it's ever been in they 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 talk to a bunch of different um breweries and blenderies in there from motor lambic uh, i believe tilcom was in there lindemans all that stuff but they really kind of hyper focus around three of the lambic makers one being cantillon that they pretty much the whole roy family uh gene senior and um uh got a uh, grandson uh, are kind of the driving force in, in the whole i wouldn't say driving force but the um the spine of the film um they go in the dre fontaine not much really 
there's no Armand in there aside from pictures and um, and references and talked about. It's pretty much his partners that um, very close to him that are kind of running the brewery now. And um, and then uh, uh, friggin' Raph from Bach. I know it's a, a Baca, I think is how I say it, but I call it Baca, so we're just going to call it that, Rock Rider. Um, and uh, it pretty much focuses on those three. And it's a really interesting kind of combination of it. So the first thing is first. They kind of go into, um, well, at least from the opening scene title. I missed the first couple of minutes. I actually got there 15 minutes early. Um, and then, <laughs> oddly enough, I'm allergic to something. I'm not quite sure what it is. And I ate something about 20, 30 minutes before there, like a little kind of sampler food thing. And it had whatever ingredient that I'm allergic to was in there. So I literally got there 15 minutes early, about 10 minutes to where the movie started. I popped up and I'm like, I need to find Benadryl right now. So I ran to a, a Rite Aid, <laughs> came back, and then, uh, and then it was just a, the title came in. So I probably missed the first minute of the movie um, or the documentary. But it pretty much just focuses strictly on Cantillon from the beginning and Trey Fontaine and kind of shows some really cool old stock footage of them kind of um, sitting at a market um, selling their wares, you know, over over there. Um, and it would be, you know, just kind of putzing around, nobody buying anything. And they actually make a joke, and I forget who actually made the joke, whether it was, uh, uh, I think it was Senior Van Roy from Cantillon, and he's just like, yeah, you can see in the video, we're not doing anything, we're not, we're not selling anything sitting there. And it kind of goes into the story of the brewery and how they kind of came into existence at least in the minds of people, more specifically the minds of people globally. Um, you know, they've always been around over there. Uh, you know, talking about everywhere from Potland to the Sen Valley, the whole nine. They know they've existed for, for that period of time. But these videos are from, I believe, the 80s into the in and 70s to 80s into the 90s and that's when really kind of lambda kind of made its hay here in the united states and that's where they kind of the video kind of takes us takes us from lambic kind of being this this kind of terroir based kind of drink that kind of enters itself in the united states they talk to the, all the shelton brothers all three of them actually usually you don't get all three in a room at the same time it's easy to get joel uh it's kind of hard to get dan and i even forget the third <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shelton Brothers uh, name because he never comes on anything but he, they kind of talked about how and this story's been told many many times before about how they um, finally got Cantillon to come to the United States and uh, I think it was the late 80s or 90s I think it was 90s and actually covered this when I interviewed the Shelton Brothers at the Shelton Brothers Fest a couple of years ago on the podcast and uh, how they just couldn't even really you know after the first truckload uh, or, or container of um, that they sold, they really couldn't sell it for several years. You know, there was a big kind of hype around this, these mystical breweries over there. People didn't understand what sours were. They came over here, and people ordered a, a bunch and going, "Yay, we finally get the stuff!" And then they were like, "Wait a minute, all this beer is bad. There's something wrong with it." And they're like, "No, it's not bad. This is just how it tastes." Um, and it kind of covers that history, and 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 talks about how lambic breweries you know, really kind of, they were close to dying, you know, there was, uh, I think the graphic was, I'm recalling based on, off of mind here, I, I took all my notes after the movie, because I didn't want to sit there typing, um, being that jerk in a movie theater, um, but there was like 60 some odd Lambic breweries up until the 70s, 80s, and by the time you got into the 80s, there's only six left, and even, you know, Cantillon was like, you know, we kind of became like a, a historical preserved kind of museum for goose um and uh and that kind of helped them kind of stay afloat without that they were like yeah we wouldn't wouldn't have been able to exist that's not something i actually knew either um and um and how they kind of treaded water and 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 use the kind of the maturation of the American beer drinking public um, and wrote it out until they started to see a little bit of, hey, you know, for the most part, they're actually losing a bit of money. They actually talk about how, you know, the whole Lindemann line of things where they were taking and they were just adding sweeteners to goose and, and making everything sweet in order for it to be something that people could drink and, and really get to the point where the beer really starts to take off over here, and a combination of a couple different things. One, they were hurting because they were charging relatively low prices for what they do, and I agree with that. But the whole 
super sense of lambic thing is still something that's a little bit kind of, I don't know, irky to me in a certain sense. And they talk about how, you know, they're basically barely staying afloat and, um, and how that kind of wave of, you know, beer knowledge, you know, people getting into beers, knowing more than just, you know, basic hops, basic sweet, basic things like that, turning it over, actually with Lambic becoming something and Goose becoming something quite a bit more popular, they started to see the growth, you know, that they needed. Um, and it was kind of interesting to kind of uh, see how far they went. It's almost, it almost mirrors like, um, uh, the record industry, the vinyl industry and how like that was so popular and then it just almost crippled and died. Now it's actually one of the best selling, uh, mediums for when it comes to music and, um, and just starting this wave of like hype beer, um, that didn't really hit the Lambic market up until, a certain time, I would probably say into the late aughts, early teens, I would say, you know, there was, there was hype around beer, but Lambic was still kind of, um, uh, not top of people's minds and how once they actually, um, they got to the point where, where people were coveting, not just their beers, but aged and vintage selections of beers. That's when things really started to take off. And, and it's really interesting how they cover it and how the breweries basically you see the old guard of the brewery, not the Armand side, but more the senior Roy um, side of things where, you know, his grandson's running the show now and it's all about production. He keeps saying that production, production, production. He's like, that's not what we should be about. And, and just trying to keep up with the demand now uh, of their beers as opposed to finding something that would actually buy it. It's a really cool journey to take in a film to see them to go from that point to there to where it's like, what do we do? Do we do we open up part of this brewery as a museum space or um, do we just need it for all the stores that we need? Um, and it's super interesting to see that journey on film. Um, and, the, and that third part of that, which I didn't really um, touch on yet, is the Baca Rider uh, par portion of the show. In the grand scheme of things, you know, you're talking about Dre Fontaine, and you're talking about Cantillon, there's decades, decades and decades and decades and hundreds of years of tradition there. Um, and they very much kind of lean heavily into that. Um, but then, you know, the whole, you know, Bach Rider, the Raft sort of thing, it's very, very young, you know, he's only been making beers for a very short period of time, especially compared to the other ones, to see the movie kind of take the focus on those three, which, and have that new school part of it, deserved part of it, people love his beers and, 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 and digging his stuff quite well, quite, um, quite voraciously is that a word i don't know anyway um it was interesting to see him kind of included in 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 the same what sort i'm looking for <sighs> impact you know cantillon drives the movie like i said but um you know dre fontaine and bach are definitely hefty portions of the documentary um, well, actually, the most hefty portion of the documentary is the amount of cigarettes that Raph smokes throughout the whole documentary. It's like the dude can't exist without ripping a heater, which is my favorite part of the whole thing, is just seeing the dude rip cigarettes anywhere he goes. That was the best part about it. They did a, um, a portion where they were showing the Night of Great Thirst up at Ebenezer's in, in, in Maine, and, and he's just, like, smoking in the basement <laughs> in the cellar and stuff. Fantastic. Anyway, um... And um, it just shows that, like, the new school mentality. Because, you know, while, while Bach is, there's a lot of tradition there, it's very much kind of do, do his own thing. Like, he just wants to make tasty his version of what Lambic is. He doesn't make his own beer. He uh, doesn't create his own wort, I should say. He has that produced somewhere else, and he does all the blending and mixing and all that stuff in-house with uh, tons and tons of fruit, way more fruit than a lot of the other breweries deal with. And he's found his own niche and is kind of writing his own version of that kind of tradition when it comes to Lambic. Because I don't think people, and Goose, I don't think people would 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 say he doesn't exist in that in that world, yet he's doing it quite a bit different. So when they show those kind of histories of the way um, those breweries kind of came up, and uh, seeing that new school kind of added, and it was a very cool kind of kind of comparison. And and as I touched on the beginning, it was really cool to see it done in a way that was more. I guess you want to say romantic when you're when you're leaning heavily into a documentary that is very much about history and tradition. There has to be a spark of romance in there. You can't have something about that without having that involved but it wasn't a lot of like 
it was, you know, the Brewers, especially Hogard, especially Senior Van Roy, is very much like, you know, pooping on new school beer and how it, you know, it bothers him so much that it exists and stuff like that. But there was very little of that. There was very little kind of attack stuff when it comes to other forms of beer, whether it be hazy IPA or those kind of things. It was very much kind of um, very informational, but showing three distinct different um, ideas of where the brewery is and where the brewery is going. You know, Cantillon more specifically, not to spoil too much if you don't watch it, it's, it's, it's showing the handoff tradition, the traditional handoff from the senior to the junior with, um, you know, uh, Senior Van Roy's grandchildren and children um, running the show, more specifically younger Gene kind of being the brewer and doing those kind of things and, and kind of, you know, taking his 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 youth under his wing now and 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 kind of making that continue on sure there's going to be a bit different they're kind of creating a new cantillon kind of um uh, goose museum that ha goose can lambic museum that exists and that's the senior driving that portion of the show being like this needs to exist and how their thing is making okay this is going to be kind of a testament and a showcase of what lambic and goose is from the dre fontaine kind of things with armand passing well stepping down and passing and then having his partners you know he called them you know you know um, sons he never had kind of thing but them running the show it's very specific and very very clinical it feels like you know with the the, the brewer and blender is very much kind of starting to be a little bit more kind of a a adventurous and trying to different things to where the other portion of the show was the i would call it more like a operations manager um kind of envisioning what is in the future which is kind of like a mecca a kind of sojourn a place you would go because you love goose and lambic like with you know uh, uh air uh, bed and breakfasts and and, and and eateries and all uh, making basically dre fontaine like a destination for people to go to and then which is really interesting because then you add the Bach part portion of the show on there and what they present which is him just being like yeah i just want to make this stuff I don't want to do, I don't want to be, I don't want to exist in that kind of world. He's like, even mentions in there, he's like, you know, I'm a hundred miles away from the, those guys in Lambic Central. Not that I don't like that and don't want to appreciate it. I don't, I don't want to exist in that world and having a very, very old school mentality when it comes to making the beers and just showing those three different directions and where they're coming. I thought it ended up being a really, really cool, um, just mixture of the way it kind of came off and, and I thought it was a really well done documentary outside of just the informational portion of the show. Um, you know, the, 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 the cinematography was fantastic. Um, you know, uh, God, why am I forgetting the gentleman's name who actually made the movie? Gosh, uh, I have to look it up because then I will feel it. Oh, Jerry Frank, that's who it is. Um, who's been Oscar nominated before. Um, you know, the, the, the direction, the, the movie took and, and and the visuals they used to bring back those old films from the market um that they had of of the you know the dre and cantillon's kind of like sitting in the market selling their stuff to the 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 film the, the angles and the direction and the way the movie was cut very very pretty very very well done very easy documentary to watch in a very pretty way audio even it's very subtle a lot of like background can kind of music to not can but generic kind of music that is just kind of there to help drive the movie along but it makes so much sense and there's several portions of the show um where they drop the audio out completely or the music out completely when it's a very important um like uh dialogue going on and it's very subtle but you can tell that now there's nothing else but this person speaking and it kind of just the way it was cut together the way the visuals and the way the audio works and how they kind of laid out all that portion of the show uh was was honestly one of the better documentaries i've watched i'm biased i'm into beer it's probably one of the you know one of the you know few beer movies or documentaries that exist that of this quality you know i would you know beer hunter obviously is one of the biggest ones there's a couple out there but it just ended up being just this nice kind of kind of combination um of of something that interests me even though i'm not a super lambic nerd uh in combination with really great storytelling great footage and great um quality and it's honestly something i think you'd dig um I'm not going to sit here and say it's the best documentary I've ever seen, but in the beer world, it's quite a bit up there. Um, and I'm not sure when it's going to be released 
from uh, in, uh, to the public or online streaming or any of those sources. But like I said, if if you're interested in the history um, of beer, it, it could be something a little bit more niche you know. Um, you know, I, I read a couple of reviews after I watched the movie just to get a curious, and a couple of people kind of nitpicked about how like if you didn't know this world then some of the terminology and some of the things in it you're going to get lost by i think that's i don't i don't really think you can handhold somebody through describing what bottle f fermented wild spontaneous beer is you kind of have to love those things in order to go into these movies um but if you're in beer in general um i think you'd really enjoy it as, as from a couple different directions if you're an old school beer person you probably love it just from the history and nostalgia portion of the show if you're a new school hazy it's uh Hazebro or hop flat or whatever i mean it's going to be a really interesting watch just to see something that is quite a bit different than line life um that exists and exists in a world that people you know people love more specifically the white collar world <laughs> uh loves i mean you know Lambic, Goose, those kind of beers are very much kind of drinking beers, but, you know, uh, they touch on it um, in, the, in the documentary. Um, speak with the uh, one of the co-founders of LambicInfo.info on the internet and talk about, you know, pricing and how, you know, uh, some of these, you know, bottles of, of Lambic, you know, tens of hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, um... It, it, it shows you that side of things. Briefly, um, it's probably my own personal kind of kind of nitpick for me is I believe, you know, Lambic tends to be a little bit, um, and that was kind of my trepidation going in, a little bit kind of like very, very white collar. Um, and it's, it's, it's very much a rich person's game uh, for their own, by their own making to a certain extent. Um, so it touches on that too. So just to see those kind of two worlds collide because, you know, you have the beer traders, the beer sharers, the beer purchasers, for a style that a lot of people who live in that pastry stout, super hazy world, just they don't, they don't exist. They don't understand that. And just to get a little bit of background on that, I think it would be interesting for several different groups. You know, so yeah, I thought it was a really cool film. To be perfectly honest with you, you take me in with a basic knowledge of a beer and go there. I think it's an interesting film. You take somebody who has an absolute love of the industry and craft beer and those kind of things i think you find and get a lot of it and super lambic nerds are just it's lambic porn so you're gonna love it um and uh it's definitely worth checking out so like i said just a quick kind of my thoughts on on the film um and uh and like i said it's it's still running up until i think the last showing like if you go on our website again i'll link it down below um there is a screening section, and I believe the screenings run until the end of July um, at various different locations from, you know, Asia to a couple of places in the United States, um, overseas, Europe, yada, yada, yada. There, there is a note on there on the actual site saying they're not taking any um, requests for any additional screenings. That leads me to believe, since they all cut off in mid to late July that it's going to see some kind of distribution, you would imagine, um, some kind of distribution um, after that point. I assume maybe this screening is, is an attempt to find funding for some kind of wider release or some kind of online streaming platform, um, one of those things. So my guess is if you don't catch one of these screenings um, and if you're looking for the film and interested in it, I'm guessing by the end of the year you should be able to find it whether it be on a wider release and some sort of art house film um, uh, location or online and, and whatnot. But if it does, if and when it does get released, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, I'll post an update on that. But yeah, Bottle Condition, uh, the movie, all about that Lambic life, yo. And uh, worth a watch, especially if you're into beer. Um, it, it's very cool to see three breweries that make... Wildly different beers, technically, but the same kind of beers in over different times and traditions look to do something quite a bit different um, in their future plans while moving forward, while still retaining that history and tradition, so or creating their own. So, yeah, give it a whirl. Like I said, I'll link anything down below. Let's talk about it. Have you seen the film? Have you heard about it? Let's put it that way, uh, or say that first. Have you heard about it if you had? 
Are you interested in seeing it? Uh, if you have not heard about it, are you interested now? And more specifically, if you've seen it down there, let me get your thoughts on it. Let me know your favorite parts of the uh, documentary. If it's not Raph ripping heater cigarettes the whole time, and he's like ripping 100 stewards, not even like regular cigarettes. It's fantastic. Uh, if that's not your favorite part, I'm not sure what's wrong with you. But um, yeah, all that fun stuff down there. So there you go. Movie review in the books. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Hopefully you catch the screening. The movie sometime. And I'll see you next time. Cheers, y'all.